What's up all you awesome Magic players out there? Today, about half the spoilers are out for Modern Horizons 2, and I was really trying to wait, but I just couldn't wait anymore. I was able to get a list of 10 cards that I think will see some sort of impact in Modern. Relative impact, definitely going to be different as we get up this list, but I wanted to do a top 10 initial impressions from this first half of the set, as I imagine a lot of these... Uh, Bottom three, bottom four, maybe even more cards could be shifted out depending on what gets spoiled in the coming time. However, I did want to give a shout out to some of these cards that might not make a final top 10 list because they're not bad. So <clears throat> I'm going to dive right into it here at number 10. As you can see, we have Silver Bluff Bridge. And for those of you who don't know why this would see play, there is an insole artifact deck kind of roaming around, along with Darksteel Citadel. This is like the colored version that makes both their colors, um, as well as still being indestructible, which is important for insole artifact. If we just load that up here, for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> it basically just turns any artifact into a 5-5. <clears throat> So this becomes a 5-5 indestructible that can still tap for your colored sources if you aren't attacking with it yet. Um, in the end, this is just a decent land upgrade to a deck that isn't particularly good right now. However, I'm sure that deck is uh, pretty freaking happy getting anything from this set, let alone a no land upgrade, which is not bad. <coughs> Number 9 here on the list, we have Cauldra Complete. So, I mean, what's there to say about this card? It's contesting Batter Skull in the Stoneforge decks. There's a decent chance Stoneforge decks go for a 1-1 split of both of these cards and drop one of the swords. If I had to choose personally my pick for which sword to cut out of current Stoneblade versions, which currently run Batter Skull, Sword of Fire and Ice, and Sword of Light and Shadow, I would say Fire and Ice needs the cut right now. Um, for reasons that we'll get into later, I think Light and Shadow is just uh, way, way more important, uh, given the way I think the meta is going to shape up. I do think this card is going to see a lot of play in the initial release of Modern Horizons 2, um, both by hype and by the fact that it fits into a deck that I think is going to be broken, and that is Black White Stoneforge. So, in terms of, like, long-term impact, that's a little bit more debatable. Um, there might come a point where Batter's Goal is just deemed to be better than this, simply because having lifelink and vigilance is more important than having all of these keywords, and they both win the game. So, this one wins the game more and faster. However, the question is, is that better than being able to secure wins against more aggressive decks. And I don't think this is as good as Batter Skull. I'm going to be quite honest. I think that people are going to think it's better than Batter Skull, and then over time people will realize, hey, this wins more than Batter Skull when I'm ahead, but this doesn't do much when I'm behind compared to Batter Skull, which literally, <clears throat> single-handedly, will win you every single game. So... It's so like, how much more do you need to win if you're already casting Batter Skull? And personally, my answer is, you really don't need to be. But I'm sure I could be proven wrong on this. I had definitely had to give it a shout out, though, here at number 9. It's definitely going to see some play. Um, coming in at number 8, we have Yavimaya Cradle of Growth. So this is the green herb ward now. For those of you who don't know herb ward, we already have this effect for swamps. And this for forests is actually considerably nice. There are things that really do care about how many forests you have. There are things that benefit just your forests. Um, not a ton of those seeing play in modern right now. However, this is just a nice one of land to stick into most of your green decks. So long as you're not worried too much about fixing your opponent for green, which most green decks don't really have color issues. So I can't imagine that's that much of a problem. Um, this should just be a pretty instant one of in basically every green deck. And that doesn't make it insanely powerful, but it could be good with cards like um, 
actually realized that I might not have put this card on the list. If It does deserve to be on the list if it isn't on it, uh, and that is the elf card that they're getting, Kyrian Ranger. So Kyrian Ranger, you can bounce any forest back to your hand, which now means any land if you have that herb. new um, herb board version for green. To untap a creature, which obviously is great for elves, as untapping creatures allows them to generate a ton of mana. And returning a forest to your hand means that you don't actually have to play a ton of lands, since you can uh, basically reuse that forest to basically act as a double land for a turn as you tap it, bounce back to your hand, and then replay it. So, um, definitely these two cards, if not Kyrian Ranger, if it's not on the list, put it as a pairing with this this uh, Urborg land, so they work very well together. Going into number seven. Anyway, Esper Sentinel. Now, Esper Sentinel is speculation on my part. However, I think it's good speculation simply because there are so many chances for this to see play. Um, scaling, its ability scaling on power is nice. Obviously, it's probably inspired by Rhystic Study. Rhystic Study triggered on anything. This is the first non-creature spell, which is way worse. However, this comes on a artifact human body for one mana, and that is a lot of chances to see success in modern, let me tell you right now, because an artifact deck will actually be pretty happy having this at least accessible for their 75, and human stacks are also known for bumping power and toughness. Uh, we're looking at cards like Archbound Ravager for on the artifact side can potentially, while this is on the stack, uh, increase its power when it checks the ability on resolution. I believe that's the way that works. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, um, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So you can pump it with uh, Archbound Ravager potentially. <clears throat> If they're going with the lightning bolted or something, you can just like make it a 4-4 and then get to draw a card. That, that's not nothing. And Humans is another deck that also pumps its power with cards like uh, Thalia's Lieutenant, putting plus one plus one counters on it. Um, could potentially be useful in some matchups and it might see sideboard play there. Though I am less certain about that. I think if it saw play, it would be like in a resurgent of an artifact deck, more likely. Um, in the end, I do like Esper Sentinel, and I would like to also say that it might not make the cut compared to Archbound Mouser in a main deck, if it if we are just talking about artifact decks. Mouser is a card that didn't make the list, however, I did want to give it a shout out. I think it's a card that's going to be heavily overlooked, but if we do get an artifact deck back, which I'm not sure we're quite ready for, but... It might happen. Um, Mouser, I think, is going to be a nice addition. Again, this uh, lifelink keyword, very, very good with cards like Archmount Ravager, which can scale that up and help you win aggressive matchups. Um, and the modular itself means that it can transfer its counters if it doesn't work out. So I'm a big fan of Archmount Mouser if there's an artifact deck. And if there is, Esper Sentinel might see play there. So I had to give it a higher spot uh, simply because it has more chances of getting in. Now, coming in at number six, we have <clears throat> Ig Noble Hierarch, John Noble Hierarch. It's really not too much to say about this card. It's very, very good, and Jund are considered some of the most synergistic colors to go together as well as some of the best. Um, this is very, very good at enabling Croxa in terms of um, <clears throat> making it so you don't need as many black and red without green sources, as your green sources can translate into black and red sources to help you pay the double black, double red cost. Um, I mean, there's not really too much to say here. This is obviously going to be great and quite expensive. So <clears throat> I, don't, I didn't see how much they were pre-ordering for. I would start pre-ordering these at uh, 30, because I think that's going to go up in the hype weeks and then go kind of stabilize around that. <clears throat> anyway, enough about the magic market speculation. Let's move on to, I believe, number five. Yes. Sanctifier and the back. Man, what a card. Um, Wizards has begun to see that people are saying, hey, rest in peace is a bit slow. 
and it doesn't really impact the board. And they're like, sure. All right, uh, let's just blend Rest in Peace and Oriok Champion and just create this complete hate card. Holy shit. Like, this is an upgrade on Rest in Peace. It's one-sided Rest in Peace, which is, please do not underestimate how much this one-sided effect has in the sideboard matchup. Like, the fact that it's one-sided is really, really good. Rest in Peace initially turns off your cards like um, Snapcaster Mage, which is a pain in the ass because you'd like to still use your Snapcaster Mage to potentially add the amount of cheap removal you have access to, but with Rest in Peace you can never Snapcast or something, it just becomes an Ambush Viper. Whereas Sanctifier on deck, if you're just playing like a blue-white control deck with Snapcaster, well it's not going to exile any of your shit. All it's going to do is exile your opponent's shit. Completely ridiculous. It has protection from black and red, which means it's basically impossible to kill for the decks that it struggle. Well, it does best against decks that struggle against it. Um, <clears throat> man, how much more do I need to say about this card? This card is a premium white sideboard card. Um, this has been a strength of white in the past, and people complain that white is too weak these days. And it's just like, well, in modern history, white was stronger earlier on. Um, it's kind of fallen out of favor with a bit of the power creep and hasn't really stood up to say, here's white strengths. And white strengths back in the day were strong sideboard options. It was one of the big ones. Um, cards like Rest in Peace were considered much more premium back then as things were a little bit <clears throat> slower in terms of graveyard decks and their enabling. Um, Man, I could do an entire essay about this card. Let's just say I'm really happy that Wizards is keeping White's great sideboard card identity as they try to start pushing White into a more modern age. So, massive fan of this card. This might be my favorite card in the set. I'm not even kidding. And I'm sure you guys can tell. Um, great job, Wizards. I'm very pleased. Going on to number four. And here we start getting to some of the real powerhouses. Solitude, or as I'm sure it was called in testing, either Force of Swords to Plowshares or Force to Plowshares. Um, force to Plowshares does roll off the tongue better. Let's just say the testing team called it that, because I can't imagine they didn't. Um, this is part of the Force cycle. It is instant speed, Swords to Plowshares for zero mana, with the downside of needing to exile a white card out of your hand, so you need to two for one yourself. Um, upside being that this has a creature body, which you could potentially flicker with a card like Ephemerate, as well as obviously zero mana being a significantly good cost for any piece of good interaction, such as a card like Swords to Plowshares. Um, <clears throat> what do I need to say about this other than that? It's in the same color as Ephemerate, so as we're going to talk about with some of the later picks, that increases its viability simply because Ephemerate and this card play so well together. Um, so yeah, I, I can't imagine a world where this sees no play in Modern, at least while Ephemerate, as well as some of the other cards we're about to talk about, are really havocing the format. I think that's going to be a nice boon for it. Um, it's never going to be bad, though. This is the type of card that doesn't get worse over time. Like, this is just going to be a mainstay for a long time, I think. Moving on to number three. Another new mainstay for a long time. Counterspell. Oh my god. Are you surprised that I put Counterspell on a list of modern cards that are going to make a long-term impact or just an impact in modern? Come on, man. People have been talking about if Counterspell is going to be printed in Modern for years. People are saying, oh, is Modern too fast for Counterspell? Bullshit is Modern too fast for Counterspell. Legacy isn't too fast for Counterspell. There are still decks that play it. So uh, whatever arguments are there, wrap them and uh, go and smoke them because that's where they belong. Uh, Counterspell is going to be fantastic for blue control decks. Definitely, definitely a huge win to get this in the format. Uh, don't have to worry about all of the issues that come with cards like Mana Leak when you just cast Counterspell. Uh, 
gives your deck more scaling at basically no price. And that just increases the incentive to play blue decks. Obviously it itself needs to be in a shell that's viable with a card like Mana Leak already, but I, I mean, yeah, this is going to see play. This is going to see a shit ton of play. So number three spot, well-deserved. <clears throat> and now we move from the definite, stable, long-term impact cards in Modern to the cards that might be pushing it a little much. But I don't think this next one is going to get banned. I don't think the number one one is going to get banned. Moving on to number two. It's subtlety. I mean, let's just talk about it because there are a lot of people that do not believe in subtlety. And man, I cannot tell you how much of a mistake that is. Let me just tell you why. Okay, first off, this card does a great job at combating number one. And I think there's no surprise that number one on this list is grief. I'm just going to give it away. You knew it. I knew it. If you didn't know it, then uh, you haven't been paying attention. And I can give you a really nice explanation why in a little bit as we talk about grief. However, subtlety is actually an efficient way to delay grief in order for you to be able to get to things like counterspell and counterspell grief if they try to two for, or two for one themselves again. And then your counterspell basically just wins you the game. So the amount of like ability to get you into other interaction is nice. However, that's not what makes this card so great. What makes this card so great is, first off, it's an upgrade on Venser Shaper Servant. Uh, Svan, I, I can't remember. Svan, Shaper Svan, Jesus Christ. I never remember the card's name. <clears throat> Putting it on top or bottom of the deck is a nice upgrade. However, Venser can already hit things that are on the battlefield where this has to counter it as it's coming down. However, the ability for this to be zero mana and instant speed is massive. The ability for this to pitch to force of negation in potentially some decks that don't really run a lot of creatures or planeswalkers and are more running on that non-creature spell side, uh, force of negation and subtlety play so well together in modern. Um, this is a decent card when cast for four mana if you get the ability off. It's a decent threat. Um, it still works well with Ephemerate. I mean, it doesn't work as well as Grief with Ephemerate, obviously, um, that, but that's broken, and this is more fair in terms of what it gives you with Ephemerate. Um, I don't think this card is too broken for Modern, but I really think it's pushing it. <clears throat> Man, I see people who think that this card is just not going to see play in Modern, and I just don't get it. It's like... it. Zero mana interaction has to be really bad to see no play in modern. Heck, even the zero mana deal one damage spell was like seeing frequent play. I still think it sees frequent play just because it triggers prowess for some things. Obviously, this doesn't do that. However, I mean, they're playing a pretty shitty card just because it's zero mana and it can trigger prowess. So what does subtlety do with an effect like grip tide generally if they want to keep their card? I mean, that's just a great deal. <clears throat> and as we said, this is a way to deal with turn one grief on the grief ephemerate on the draw, or just turn one grief on the draw efficiently. And that's going to be very valuable in the coming months. Though I imagine people are just going to say that the best way to be playing grief is just to play grief as well. So, moving on to our new Hogak with no surprises, is Grief. I mean, let's just talk about this. Okay, there are a lot of reasons Grief are bro is broken. Let's... We're going to talk about Grief Ephemerate, because that's what really is broken. So, what are the potential upsides of Grief Ephemerate? Well, if you get Grief Ephemerate off, you get to discard three cards out of the opponent's hand and get a 3-2 Menace Body. For one mana, you get all of those effects and the cost of three cards. Well, if you add up the 3-2 Menace on turn one, which is definitely a, a very decent card, as well as the three discards, well, that's four cards. Well, you're getting an extra net card advantage for Grief Ephemerate going off for one mana. 
But the thing is, these aren't like not irrelevant, like just card draw. This is four cards of tempo in exchange for three cards from your end and one mana. Hello? Who on Wizards saw this and thought it was okay? I, I gotta be honest with you guys. This is, this needs to, dude, I would ban it before it was released. Okay, let's talk about, okay, but Grief Ephemerate is pretty high risk because I can just kill your Grief in response to you casting Ephemerate and then I get a massive, huge card swing. Well, that never happens, and let me tell you why. Because when you play Grief with the Evoke, you put the Evoke on the stack first so it resolves last, and then you put the discard on the stack. You let the discard resolve, you see if they have interaction. If they only have one piece of interaction, you could take it. Now the coast is clear for your ephemerate. If they have more than one piece of interaction to deal with your turtle on grief, good for them. Don't cast the ephemerate. It's a bit of a loss, but you'll take something else out of their hand, and now their hand is basically trash. So you need multiple pieces of removal for zero to one mana in order for this to stop grief ephemerate. You can't have one because the grief first discard will strip it out of your hand before you, they need to cast ephemerate. So man, I mean, why? I don't get it, man. They could have fixed this card. All they had to do was like, instead of saying non-land card, just say non-land, non-creature card. Like non-land card and you lose some life. Or like I, They needed to make some conditions on this discard. This universal, no life loss, no condition discard combined with ephemerate for net card advantage and board pressure and tempo. Ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. Um, Wizards has done it again. Well done. This is just wonderful design. Fuck's sake, man. Can they just stop breaking modern with modern horizons? It isn't hard. I'm just wondering, because you know they tested Grief Ephemerate in testing, but I'm just wondering if they got, like, a random dude off the streets who doesn't know how to play Magic the Gathering. It's like, here's your deck, play Grief Ephemerate, and this new player doesn't even know what the fuck Evoke is, because that's the only way I can see this getting through testing. Hello? Okay, that's enough of a rant, but man, I had to rant there. That Grief Ephemerate is broken, guys. So, hopefully that gets the ban, because it's disgusting if it doesn't. It's probably going to last for six months, ruining the format, just like Hogak, before Wizards admits that they fucked up again. Hopefully, hopefully, Subtlety doesn't need the ban. I think Subtlety is the strong but fair version of Grief. So, there we go. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, y'all have a legendary day. I'm out.